Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I'm Ali Ogasian, and I'm one of the organizers of the event. Um, so Setting Out explores how the nature of expeditions has evolved into the modern day. Incorporating the work of archaeologists, engineers, scientists, and artists exploring a variety of realms, both geographical and beyond, the exhibition demonstrates that all of these expeditions share the same eager hunger to uncover the unknown. Thank you, Ali. <laughs> do you want to take a seat? Or do you want to stay? Oh, you still. <laughs> um, welcome, and thank you for coming out this evening. Um, it's a very cold evening. <laughs> so we're really honored here to have this evening um, Jana, Jana Kaplan and Heidi Nielsen um, to discuss topics uh, relating to human survival in outer space. Um, Jana will draw on her experience as a space research specialist to discuss the tasks and challenges preparing astronauts for space flight, while Nielsen will present uh, her Menu for Mars Supper Club project, which envisions the future of cuisine in Mars. Um, so a brief um, introduction to Jana. Jana, I always get it wrong, got to get it right. <laughs> Jana Kaplan is a lecturer in psychology and senior research associate at Brandeis University uh, Grebiel Lab, and she's specializing in neuropsychology and space research. Uh, she studies human adaptation to various conditions of space flight, uh, such as zero-g, high-g, artificial gravity, environment, spatial orientation. You can tell me if I'm wrong here. <laughs> and space, mo space motion, sickness, and movement errors in changing gravitational <laughs> force environments. Um, so welcome, Jana. Thank you. And I'll introduce Heidi Nielsen, who's to my left. Um, Heidi is an artist addressing topics such as weather, fake snow, and the cultural landscape of outer space. Her work is often collaborative and publishing based. She is a member of the ABC Artist Book Collect Cooperative, co-founded SP Weather Station, and her work is included in over 60 museum and university collections. Hi everybody, um, thanks for coming and thanks Apex Art and Shona and Ali for inviting me. Um, so I'm here to talk about the Menu for Mars Supper Club which is organized by me and Douglas Paulson. Um, and uh, first, and ba basically, it started out as a, a supper club um, that was an educational program of Flux Factory. And the idea was that we would go out to different restaurants around New York City. And we chose our restaurants um, based on cuisines that, had base, that were based in countries that had active space programs of one kind or another. And at each one, we invited um, a, a special guest of some kind or another to come and talk to us kind of casually over dinner about how we would envision um, how the menu that we looked at and also what their expertise uh, um, to envision what the future of cuisine might be on Mars. And so we would, at each meeting, we would review all of the, you know, we'd have sheets around that we'd write notes on and everything, but we'd review the actual fa the facts for what we know about the conditions on Mars. Um, and uh, so this is an example of it. Um, in this one, we had our guest was an astrophysicist, Jana Krevich, and she spoke to us about cooking methods. Um, but th the main thing here is that people living on Mars would always be in a pressurized environment, so always inside It'd be basically like camping inside of an of a airplane capsule forever, <laughs> or being in a spacesuit. Um, so, so it's uh, kind of in the tradition of Mars analogs, where, pla where um, places on Earth are chosen to be very, you know, that as close as possible to the conditions on Mars, and then people go there and, um, and sort of pretend like they're living on Mars. And so there's a bunch of different ones of these, you know, like actually funded NASA ones where they um, try out space equipment and so on, and then ones like this that are more um, uh, space enthusiasts go. Um, so we also looked at the International Space Station, so um, all of the things that are going on there. I mean, Mars is really different from the microgravity of the International Space Station, but we're sort of looking at the, the approaches and everything that we have now. So. Um, 
So we were looking at the environment that they're eating in and noticing things like, like the sriracha there that's like Velcro taped to the wall. Um, it, it turns out that sriracha, for example, and other things that are really spicy are actually really popular foods because, um, because the, a lot of the conditions of, um, of the body in space make, for example, your head really stuffy. So it's like having a cold, at least for the first few, first few weeks or something. So um, they, you know, having spicy foods is like usually is quite popular. Um, and so we're also looking at um, at adaptation, adaptations of different traditions. So like the, um, the turkey here on the wall, like for Thanksgiving. Um, and, you know, making special meals. Like most of the meals on the International Space Station are already prepared. They're like meals ready to eat. And so all you can do is just heat them up. You know, they're just already set up and you just like open the bag and then eat out of it directly. Um, but in this case, this is an astronaut who was preparing a special meal and it's from her blog. And um, so it was all about, you know, like combining different ingredients and making them in Ziploc bags and like trying to squish the ingredients around in the Ziploc bags because you can't have anything like crumbs or anything in space, like nothing that can float around, obviously, because it would like get in your eyes or like in your ears or whatever. So, um, and you can't have any open flame. So like on the left is, the, is a flame in microgravity, on the right is a regular candle. So, um, so how that adapts to things like a birthday cake, right? So if you can't have crumbs, because those are totally out, and you can't have flame, so you can't have candles, like how do you celebrate something like a birthday? So like how does that, you know, how would you bring like a tradition to a whole other environment. So this is, a, um, this is an inflatable cake that was given to a commander. <laughs> so that was the way around at that time. Um, so anyway, that's the kind of thing that we would discuss um, at the Menu from Mars Supper Club. So this is dim sum, out for dim sum, and we were looking at eating, um, eating insects. So we were examining like, the idea of, uh, of using insects as an alternate source of protein. Um, so flash forward about a year, um, this is um, last year, uh, May and June, at um, the boiler space in, at, in Brooklyn uh, of Pierogi Gallery, and we, were, uh, we decided that we wanted to, with all of this accumulated knowledge, actually try cooking for ourselves. And so we set up this inflated, um, this inflated kitchen, so we basically took construction plastic and duct taped it together and inflated it with a fan. And, um, and we set up this whole habitat, uh, and we, we looked at a whole bunch of different aspects of, of living on Mars, but the central part, it, so I just wanted to illustrate that it's um, more extensive than we have time for here, and it involves more than 20 artists doing various projects um, in it. And, but anyway, centering on the kitchen itself um, in, the, in the middle, so this is the interior, um, we had this pantry. So, the pantry was all ingredients that have extremely long shelf life, like like they're uh, like they're going to have, um, like they're planning for for Mars. So there are all these. We were pretending like it was kind of like a shipment to Mars. So all the things are um, are like freeze dried foods or, bev you know, like powdered things, um, thermo stabilized things. Um, basically, nothing that's fresh. So like all fresh foods are out, anything that's, so we had like kind of a strict, you know, like no fresh foods in here, you had to like use the equipment that's in there. But the idea um, is that people could, um, could kind of peruse through the, the uh, ingredients and then cook for themselves, like try to cook from this ingredients. I mean, this is from an event that we had just two weeks ago in Washington, D.C., so I'm kind of like interspersing both of the things. But, um, but anyway, so you would open the bags and like rummage through the, in the different ingredient lists and, uh, and try cooking some stuff. So various experiments going on. This was like dried mango <laughs> in a bowl. And then uh, more cooking. And then also to write down all the ingredients you're using and then your instruction sheet, the idea of making a recipe. So we were collecting those and then doing things like noting on the, on the sheets um, if there were any physical things that were happening that might be different on Mars. So kind of like trying to envision those things. Um, we were smelling, taking the smells of the things and seeing if they were appetizing. 
and tasting them, and then ultimately sharing on user reviews like of the, of the recipes. So, um, and, and the kind of funny part in the whole thing is that like the food isn't that good, <laughs> you know? Like all of us are interested in, you know, fresh cuisine and like farm to table kinds of things. And so this was like a struggle to make things um, really what, you know, uh, inventive and, and interesting. Um, and so, um, so anyway, we, all, we vacuum packed a, a sample of it um, and, um, which was a lot of fun actually. It was just like a really engaging thing to do. And then labeled the sample so that it matched the recipe. And then we, we were starting a book like that, um, which we're still working on now. Um, yeah, so that's a label. <laughs> and then so we're collecting this book with all, of the, with all of the findings and the ideas that we're combining all of them um, and sending them to NASA and other space program um, initiatives to help them out with all of our research. So anyway, that's my, that's the menu from our supper club. <laughs> Can I use your mic? Oh yes, please. Um, because this is a good angle. <laughs> well, so now I have to give you a um, lecture on uh, space flight uh, human factors in three minutes. Um, so this is what I do. I study human factors in space flight from the point of view of neuropsychology, neurophysiology, and um, what is understood to be within human factors spectrum are all those things. You can read them. Uh, space motion sickness is a beauty because that one um, involves a lot of vomiting. <laughs> and um, vomiting is a com it's not it's really not a sickness it's not a disease at all it's a completely normal reaction of human body to very very abnormal um, environmental features and so um, vomiting on earth is really no big deal because um, vomit goes down to the ground because of gravity. <laughs> now, in zero G, you see, there is um, all forces cancel out. Okay, so this, it's a weightless environment. So, vomitus, vomitus, being a liquid thing, breaks as all liquids in zero G, breaks down into micro caplets, and they just float around. So you inhale them, that can cause pneumonia or any other kind of internal infections, which is bad enough, but what is even worse is that it can float into electronic equipment and short circuit and create all kinds of calamities, which we don't want. So vomiting really needs to be avoided at all costs. So one of my uh, major specialties is uh, the the research in space motion sickness. Now, Mars is an interesting environment. It's not a weightless environment. It has one third approximately of Earth gravity. Moon has one six approximately. So there is a certain gravity there. So vomitus will go to ground, but not as fast. And will kind of start disintegrating en route to the ground. <laughs> Again, um, going back to Heidi's artwork, um, it's a very interesting uh, take on, on the colonizing Mars because you have to design your menus in such a way that you may not have motion sickness, but vomiting can be caused by certain um, disagreeable foods or other things. So. Um, and then I want to bring your attention to this. So what ethology is, is um, a study, you know, in the lab we take a sample or we take a, a, a subject, whether it's animal or person, and we study it in lab environments which are very controlled. Ethology is when we study completely unrestrained, whole body, in completely free environment with full spectrum of interaction with that environment. And so neuroethology would be studying all that 
from the point of view of understanding how brain works. How do we uh, assess our orientation? How do we interact with the environment when nothing is restrained, okay? Wind may blow, lightnings, I may have a food poisoning. There are a lot of things in the environment within and without that can interact and, no, and make no moment in time identical to another. Okay, so those things all need to be taken into account when you are in any uh, extreme environment, or critical environment, space flight being one of those, or any analog environment to, to that, where you recreate, approximate it as much as you can. And um, to study this, you know, I have to study senses, and we all know I guess I don't need this. And we all know from high school of biology that there are five senses, which is uh, wrong. For some reason, in high school biology, they neglect to study other senses, which is just as important. For example, the vestibular system. You know, we all have these bones right behind our ear. And they're inside that bone, completely encapsulated, there's not one but two senses combined into vestibular system, our system of balance. The first sense is um, otoliths, are those chambers um, with little rocks floating in, uh, in a liquid and a lymph inside. So if your mother, when you were young and misbehaving, told you that you have rocks in your head, which is completely right. There are rocks in those chambers that react to linear accelerations, translational movement. Linear acceleration makes those rocks detect it and give it that information to the brain. Semicircular canals are right next to it and they are three loops in three orthogonal spaces. They're like, you know, um, they are all perpendicular to each other. And they respond to rotations, to angular accelerations. So those two senses combined give us a very precise information how we are oriented. And that's very important because if we don't know that, then the brain kind of freaks out and <laughs> creates things like motion sickness. Okay, Motion sickness here is not caused by gastric malfunctions, <laughs> nothing about the stomach, except that the stomach expels its substance reacting to those vestibular stimuli, not to food, really. Then there's proprioception. Nobody talks about that, but it's a fundamentally important sense to bring us in sync with where we are and what we do. Anybody knows what proprioception is? Okay, can I have a volunteer? Can I use you as a, okay. Um, what's your name? David. David, could you close your eyes, please? And can I hold your hand? Okay, <laughs> David's eyes are closed. David, tell me, where is your hand? Above my head. Above his head. Now, how does he know that? None of the high school senses tell him that. How does he know that it's above? And if he, if I would move his head and he moves his fingers, he would know, thank you David, he would know exactly what his hand is doing because of proprioception. That's um, receptors that are embedded in our tendons and muscles and tell us what are the tensions within those muscles and tendons, what are the changes in viscoelastic properties. And the brain then recalls its memory of how it felt when we did see it. And then the brain calculates, and, and that, that happens in real time. It's kind of extremely quick. We don't have to think about it. We know he, he knew exactly where his hand was. Okay, he wouldn't have known that if he would deny proprioception. Then he would have to see that. Us being visual animals, our primary sense is vision. You know, bats and dolphins, primary sense is auditory, they use echolocation. So 
So the same information they would derive from um, echolocation. And so what I study is, you know, sensory perception, how all of those senses are involved in perception of space or anything around us or within us. Uh, one of the interesting perception things is perception of time. And when we start talking, when I get through this, and we start talking about the art of hand, um, Heidi has very interesting projects that explore our perception of time. And we'll talk about it during the discussion. I just want to kind of plant it into your mind. If we don't, ask us. <laughs> um, and then, you know, perception, again, starting from within, you know, how do I feel today? Um, you know, within starts with some singularity at my center of mass inside of me. And then uh, very near, where I can touch and explore, and farther away, where I use distant senses like vision. And then even farther away, where I have to use tools, whether it's a pointer, a probe, or a, or a, or a Hubble telescope. You know, I use a tool, and there is no limit to how far I can explore space. Limit is really the boundaries of our imagination. And for me as a scientist, and for you as an artist, that has no boundaries. Okay. Um, so uh, Heidi's work, I really, when I started looking at her work on her website, and it ama it's amazing how she touched upon every stage that we have to address in um, considering space flight and space explorations. You know, technology, she has a piece on, on, on um, space technology, uh, space vehicles, satellites, um, sustenance, obviously her Mars food. Remember how I mentioned how she explores in a few, several of her art, um, Works. She explores the perception of time and, and how can we manipulate that and still perceive it. And then there's a very interesting project which is on display there um, <laughs> on um, International Space Station uh, project where she, and it's amazing how she's able to take three different motions and capture the same moment in those three different motions. It's quite amazing. It really takes very brilliant imagination. So the motion is the car riding on the road. So there is this visual streaming from us looking through the window. And then there is the person is in the car, so that person is being passively um, moving, uh, moved, <laughs> and that person is flipping through pages of um, an illustrated book of the space station, of uh, photographs of the space station in space, um, which are taken from outside, from a shuttle. And she flips them with ever increasing um, speed. So eventually it crosses the continuous motion threshold and we see the space station as moving while we see the visual streaming of the road in the moving car while we are ourselves in that passive motion. I thought that was just brilliant. And then, um, you know, she deals in her art, and that's not the art she's going to be talking here, but it's on her, in her art portfolio, about um, survival in extreme environments, and she deals with issues of space debris. And we humans, you know, we are quite an advanced species of animals, but we are also very irresponsible. So we really um, polluted not only the Earth itself, but also 
the space around the Earth, all lower Earth orbits are very polluted with junk, with debris. And so every space flight needs to calculate those safe orbits. And if something deorbits from one of the orbits of junk, they need to take that into account. So a huge amount of resources of NASA, and that's our money, is spent on tracking junk in space. Each piece of junk has its orbit. There is some employee who is sitting there and tracking it. <laughs> and making sure that it doesn't have an intercept with the orbit of our space vehicle, whatever it is. Okay, so um, Heidi has this incredible art that sort of documents the junk orbits and how, and how oppressive they are. I mean, there's really no free space. I mean, if she would just plot it, you, if you can see this in 3D, you really have to warm your way through non-junk um, kind of routes there. This is also amazing. She has this art about objects that um, people, astronauts, left on the moon. And that reminded me of an extraordinary book back from Vietnam era, the things, the things uh, things we carry, things they carry. And you know, this, this things that we carry so define us. And again, moon, there are very few of those things, you know. You can see there are many, but compared to the vastness of the moon, it's very little. Um, and to see them in this kind of proximity together, then you can reconstruct what, who were those people who brought them? What did they represent? And this is one of my absolute favorites, and we'll talk about it later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, so that's that um, ISS, International Space Station thing. Um, so I already talked about it. And this is this nest variations. I mean, it was just amazing to me that she would, <laughs> as an artist, I mean, I assume you never flew in space and you were not in parabolic flight, <laughs> which I was, you know, I, I do this for a living, you know, I fly the NASA's wanted car. So this is weightlessness, and you see the relationship between the egg and the nest, and the egg is in this suspended state. And then this is low gravity, and so this in, a, in and of itself intrinsically unstable situation of this egg on top of it, its nest is possible in low G. And this is high G where it's so compressed and, and messy in terms of mass, not in terms of disorder. And you can see this from this art. You can feel the pressure and the force and you can feel this 3D total freedom in three dimensions. You know, we, we are three-dimensional animals, but all this space is wasted space. It's just here for comfort. We only use it, you know, up to here. But here we can use it. We can actually be up high. We can use the whole space. And she got it. So, well, how do I relate to those things? Um, this is a 1G, and, and, and my point is that our perception of beauty is tied to the force of gravity. What we consider beautiful is, is only beautiful here, okay? In a different gravity environment, we would be considered ugly. <laughs> we would be considered not fitted, okay? So in 1G, we have these, from our point of view, completely proportional body. Um, in 0G, and that's me, by the way, free floating in the bottom part. In 0G, there is this suspended state. So we do have a complete three-dimensionality. And you can see that egg, it's, 
it's just euphoric. And in low G, we would have this elongated, you know, you can't afford to build up the height. You, you can find this equilibrium. The bodies of basketball players would be considered much more beautiful than our bodies like that. And here, in um, high G, this will be considered a beautiful body. The body with the major, the center of mass much lower towards the surface of support. And the bodies like that cannot exist in this G. So our conception of beauty is very, very conditioned upon gravity. And I found it amazing that I, and that old slide with the human figures, I had it for years and used it in several lectures, and then I, I saw her art and I thought, oh my goodness, this is amazing. <laughs> now, about um, the menu for Mars, and I think we sh I should stop here and we can discuss it when we actually are in conversation. Okay? Okay. I know I can as well. <laughs>
in flight or, or there yeah, for you consumption. Know, in, our, um, in our habitat, we were raising crickets. Um, right. Yeah. That's one thing. So, what? Yeah. What did you think of that? Are these kinds of things being discussed? Thank you for bringing it up. Yes, they are because they are huge. They're like great source of protein, and um, non um, non vegan protein, mm -hmm. which is a different type of protein. <coughs> People are disgusted. <laughs> <laughs> Except some people from certain cultures are not, but the majority of the astronauts are from Western cultures. Yeah, and we found people would come in to, uh, and we and we had um, we had crickets that we were raising, but we also had cricket uh, powder, basically cricket meal right. flour, and so we were using the cricket flour in a couple of a couple of times. Somebody made. Um, a cricket macaroni and cheese. Um, How with, was that? It was actually really good, honestly. <laughs> yeah, she made it like a, with a bechamel. I'm, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it was really, it was particular, but it was quite good. And um, yeah, and, I, and somebody else came in and said that, that actually crickets, um, they loved eating them. They, it, it was a guy from Mexico, and he said that they ate them all the time. They would get them like popcorn mm -hmm. on the street. Yeah. And it was like a treat, a special treat. So, yeah, yeah I mean, so well, I guess it just. And NASA, and NASA has a huge section that deals with um, foods, nutrition. Crickets, if they don't look like crickets, if they're like, they like a candy bar or whatever, yeah, yeah. maybe fine. But <laughs> You know, crickets as live crickets, and the, and in in some cultures that's very um, good food, and it's extremely nutritious. That's a problem because ra again, raising crickets in a space station or in a colony is you know there are problems within that. You know, they escape, they can <coughs> infiltrate equipment. Whatever, and you know, with this in mind, I want to go to that part of your um, menu on Mars thing was actually the picture of the habitat. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's in my next yeah, slide. The, yeah, it's the habitat oh, in... Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say, let's stay with this. The, the habitat <laughs> image is... Um, <laughs> It, it's from a place in Utah, so yeah. it's a it's a Mars um, society, I believe it is um, habitat. Right. That's yeah, right. yeah, yeah. yeah. But the issue here, stop here, is the contrast between this incredible, <laughs> incredible vastness of of space in that colony, in that planet, and this constrained, claustrophobic environment of human habitation. And you brought it up that yeah. it has to be in those kind of inflatable modules or something. But tremendous amount of psychological problems come with that. You put, you know, seven unrelated individuals into this <coughs> little bubble and with the uh, recycling air, which means that all the sweat and fart and burp and everything gets recirculated. You know, people get on each other's nerves. You know, you know, one thing that we were trying to think about um, in in our habitat too was sound. Was that you'll never have a silence because it's all the machines all are the machines, going. Right. And so because of our our space was uh, was inflated by a fan, we had this kind of constant din going anyway. Um, but and then we had a sound installation by um, by John Roach. This uh, which uh, you mean like to mask? Well, it was it it kind of was atmospheric sounds that were. Um, referring to the space also. But one thing about the crickets that I discovered was that they chirp. They do. <laughs> right. They so we had like so a thousand hard. crickets. And it actually, I mean, it was great because it was this natural sound. And so it, it made this sort of comforting sound that I, and I, we didn't expect that at all. And so at one point, the, the sound installation had um, these contact mics and hydrophone mics. Um, and we put them in the cricket container. Yeah. So. Anyway, so we had we have kind of had that going with it. Well, about the sound, 
it's an interesting thing that you brought it up. And it does, it's kind of cute, you know, the cricket sounds and yeah. all. But again, um, when we study psychologically, scientifically, we study sense of comfort, okay? So all those cute and comforting things, by the time we are, we are getting on each other's nerves. By the time we have been together for long enough and everything you do irritates me because you burp at just the wrong time or you want to be by the window when I want to be by the window or, you know, there's only one treadmill and it's that. And at that time, at that stage in relationships, Cricket sound will drive you nuts. <laughs> <laughs> it Cricket literally will amplify this out of control. How so you can't have crickets. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how do you train people? Do you, you so you talk about these things and you train people for these things. What what sorts of things do you do to train? People? Well, one of the things that. Can we go to the next slide? One of the things that I brought up about your art is meals as communion, meals as relationship building. And in, um, in astronaut training protocol, this is actually used, this is actually used as what military, in the military is known as unit cohesion. So um, it builds that cohesion. And they are almost, it's almost Pavlovian conditioning. You know, they train you to commune through meals. Mm. And so meals then, they happen, and not all meals are group meals in the space flight environment. It depends on individual schedules. But they build in that time where people get together for meals and that kind of refreshes the relationship. And another thing is this, um, food as representation of identity and of tradition. And that also brings comfort into space flight tensions. I was at some point considered for space flight training with NASA. And I thought a lot about, you know, if I were an astronaut, what kind of astronaut would I be? I didn't want to be just a generic astronaut. I wanted <laughs> to be me, a Russian, American, Jewish woman scientist, okay? How do I bring all that into the space flight? And one of the things, I mean, I'm from Russia, you know, I grew up in the 50s and 60s when Jews in space, and that's my next slide, I would think of this. I would not, it would be delusional. I'd be considered a lunatic if I would read anything else into that. Yeah. Plus a woman, forget it. So, um, let's go to the next one. So, about this bringing identity into space flight, food is one of the great things. And some of the food we can bring, <laughs> and some food we cannot bring. <laughs> but the challenge is to create art and to create rituals that can bring that in and, and be consistent with tradition not disrespectful to tradition, but that's where art comes in. You've got to be creative. You can't do this, like I told you with vomit. Why? Same thing. It breaks into droplets. Now, you deal with environments that have some gravity, so it wouldn't break into droplets, but it will be very vulnerable to that. If you spill a little bit, you don't know where it'll land. Um, lighting candles. Not possible. And by the way, the fans, the noise from fans has to be, the fans have to run in, in those environments 100% of the time. Because just like with the candle, which would burn all the oxygen around it, and there, in weightlessness, there's no convection currents to bring new oxygen to the burn. 
So uh, convection currents are movements of the air that are driven by gravity. Um, hot air is light, cold air is heavy. So hot air from here goes up, cold air gets sucked in, and we have a burn. And that's why the flame looks like that, because the vector of the momentum is upward. Hot air rises up. Here, in zero G, all oxygen is burned, and then it suffocates. It just chokes on itself. So this is out. Um, barbecue <laughs> cooking is it's out. out. But yeah, yeah, yeah. hot plates, which you used, <laughs> are good. But fans need to be run because like with the candle, we will use all the oxygen in the air around us, and then we will be hypoxic. We will, be, we will have oxygen deficit. So there will be fans. Crickets and no cratings, but that's the noise <laughs> of the background in any space environment, whether it's a spaceship or a habitat in a colony. Um, yeah, but food is integral in bringing, in creating those new traditions. It's, that's how it's going to be done, through food, through um, food as communion and food as flavors that are reminiscent. And the, and the recall for those memories, that's how you train astronauts. You build it in through conditioning. Uh -huh. Can I have another slide? I don't know if I have anything. Oh, no, that's it. about the taste. The uh, taste disappears in the weightless environment or it changes and minimizes. There were several astronauts who experienced a reduced gravity on the moon. How much of their taste came back when they were in the 1 6th G of the moon, if any? Did any of their taste restore? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think they ate on the moon. Yes, it they didn't there eat. Days. They didn't eat out of the Space capsule. No. They ate inside the lunar module. Of course, but the gravity was the same okay. inside. The gravity the was the same. Yeah. I really don't know. I, I haven't heard of any long-term effects on, yeah, on taste I, from those missions, so I don't I don't know. I how. haven't either, but I there must be something. I know there are studies at NASA <coughs> on taste. Um, and on, taste on is, that is sense. important. For and it is important, especially where where food. I mean, again, taste and smell are very positively, are very affect astronauts' well-being very positively in relation with food, but very negatively in relation to the rest of the habitat because there are a lot of smells. Like the vomit comet that I fly. <laughs> I mean, that thing is, you smell it even outside the airplane. It's permeated with the smell of vomit. Oh, no. And at some point you don't notice it anymore, but smell and taste interact and they all and, and they are affected. I don't know much about that particular. Did anyone see the, the Martian, which I just happened to see recently? Does anyone know if that, you know, we are doing your simulation, but that was a large scale Hollywood, you know, kind of coming from a book. Was that close to the reality that you see when you think about these things? Um, if you've seen it? Uh, yeah, I've seen, I read the book and loved it and saw the movie, yep. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I'm all over that. Yeah, so the, the film seemed to me, I mean, it was, it was great. And I think, it, I think it has, it was written by an engineer and, you know, it has been praised for, like, exactactute or whatever. I mean, maybe you... Well, I found no, it very similar when yeah. I looked at your... Um, yeah. Inflated uh, bubbles, it looked very similar to what Matt, Di uh, Matt Damon built there for his little greenhouse. Yeah. It's exactly the same. You have to have it hermetically sealed, you have to pump air and have pressure and have, ox and have air, breathable air. Yeah. It, it did, like, I would say that it did seem. Uh, 
a little bit glamorous and a little bit too clean. Like one thing that we, that we were talking about uh, a lot was the ubiquity of dust on Mars. Like the particles of dust are super fine and we were at, uh, guessing for our habitat that it, would, that it would get in everything. And then that was one thing that you'd have to overcome in terms of food is not only the texture of that, but the taste of, of it. And that, you know, and that would be another reason or rationale or whatever for having strong flavors. So, you know, it's like getting that dust off of gaskets and out of filters and like all, it, it's electrostatically clings to everything. So, you know, it would be everywhere basically. It would track all over the place. So. Same on the moon. moon dust yeah, is also yeah. also very, very fine. Um, the air within those um, inflatable habitats is not the air pumped from the outside on, on the moon. There isn't any. In, the atmosphere of Mars is not conducive to life. So it's going to be artificially created atmosphere that's filtrated. So I don't know how the dust from the outside will get in unless it comes in with the spacesuit. And But logic question is the waste management. Mm. Because you know, the kitchen refuse and the human waste, uh, all those things you can't just throw out the window and there's no sanitation system. It has to be packaged, it has to be vacuum uh, packaged and stored until you go back home and take it with you. It's just like you go to the beach, bring it, take it back, <laughs> or whatever that phrase is. Um, but it's a huge issue in space flight is cleanliness. Space station is filthy. <laughs> it is absolutely filthy. And not because they don't, you know, wash dishes after themselves, but you know, every time you sneeze or anything, you know, everything is just floats around and you don't know where it goes. When we go on parabolic flight. I tell all my staff to take off their wedding rings, diamonds, whatever. You know, if it floats around, you'll never find it, but it'll end up in my equipment somewhere <laughs> and create problems. <laughs> Everything is just re-floating and, and even if it's precipitated somewhere, at some point it will disconnect and start floating again. The smells are terrible. It's not a healthy environment. <laughs> it's not a healthy environment. And you did, in, in, in the <coughs> of your, I took all my pictures from your um, slideshow and you had that. I mean, you touched on everything. There's this bunch of plastic cups with, you know, some crunch napkins and stuff. Like, what do you do with them? They take enormous amount of space. I mean, people, in space, the most expensive commodity is space. It's so cramped. Yeah. Question. Um, protein. What is the source of protein? Protein. <laughs> maybe maybe mealworms instead. <laughs> I'm just kidding. If we can't have crickets. Well, in your menus, you know, yeah, so protein is is an obligatory component of the menus. So there are vegetable proteins, there are um, animal proteins. We, we tried to stick with a, with a vegetarian diet on ours, and so we had a lot of, um, a lot of dried beans and, and peanut-based things and um, soy products. So and did we made, you have tofu? Um, not really, but we, had, we did make um, a tofu-like thing out of garbanzo flour. If you've ever done that, I have not. Um, but it's I really mean, interesting. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. So, I mean, we're so advanced in getting to the moon and the Mars, and technologically advanced. We're kind of willing to kind of leave everything behind with food. Surely, we we should be thinking about. I mean, I agree, kind of like you know, we want that turkey dinner, or we want. But you know, the way we're thinking is that. Like things like being a vegetarian, and then someone says, "Oh, do you want a turkey burger that's vegetarian?" And you're like, "That doesn't make sense." So, do we really need to 
think about food being reminiscent or, or taste being something that we reminisce about. You know, can we invent new tastes that actually do have all the proteins but that we're not disappointed with? You know, I can imagine when they're on moon or on a space station and like, oh, well, this is certainly not macaroni and cheese flavor as I know it. Yeah. So why, why do we strive for that when if we create these new tastes and flavors that are even more Creating beneficial. new tastes. Now that's, yeah. that's good. I like that. <laughs> like, you know, we're creating new traditions. Why not new tastes? Yeah. Yeah. Tastes Absolutely, yeah. um, are primal things. They, they're so <coughs> deep, especially those that we crave. They, they are going back to, to immediate postnatal moments and then through our, um, so creating new tastes would be, again, I'm, you know, I'm from Russia, I believe in Pavlovian conditioning, so you can train anybody to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it's possible, I, I love this idea. I would like to find out if NASA actually works on that. Because they do those burgers, they um, freeze dry them, and then there are packaging has the injectable hydration, and then you microwave it. And what comes out is a turkey burger. <laughs> now, it doesn't taste anything like, so what NASA does is they add smells. They actually have artificial substance of smell that they add to the water that you inject in it because you can't have it in the freeze-dried burger, it's not going to uh, preserve as well. So, you know, people are creative, but astronauts hate the food. On the other hand, you know, college students hate the food on college campuses. So, you know, when I came back from Russia, to me, it was like Ritz Carlton. So it's, we learn uh, as we go along, yeah. But the craving tastes are hard to change, the ones you crave. For us, for the younger generation, maybe not. Probably. We need to work fast Probably. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I mean, so. the optimal number of people in one of these bubbles, if they, let's say they're in Mars, and how many people can you put there before they start killing each other? Oh, that's yeah. a good question. Or, or Actually, teams are harmony or a team that works. That's one of the hardest questions. And I don't know in your work, like how does the group formation that goes from restaurant to restaurant to explore or meeting to meeting, is it a cohesive group? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was very fluid, but we found that it worked really well if there was about 10 people or so, you know, as far as like a conversation that everyone yeah. could, could uh, be in on. And if it was bigger than that, then it would sort of split into sub, I mean, just like any dinner group, you know? Um, so it was based on that, but I don't know if that, you know, maps really to like living together in a habitat. Yeah, <laughs> you know, technology is something NASA people can solve they have some brilliant minds there. Um, the issues of human psychology are much more difficult to resolve. Not all of them are completely predictable from the ground training. Uh, issues pop up. Issues of gender dynamics. Um, uh, In the there issues of gender dynamics. There definitely were issues and, and there were earlier observations, you know, when Americans had the Skylab back when, those were very low occupancy. They would probably have two or three astronauts. Three was considered a big crowd. With the Mir uh, station, when uh, Russians coll uh, Americans collaborated with the Russians on board the Mir uh, space station, that's when um, the extent of psychological problems became really heavy and NASA didn't know what to do about it. They didn't even, they had psychiatrists on board, you know, on, on the medical team just to 
just to check that nobody has seizures because they, you know, in their medical history. But in terms of the issues of group dynamics, there were terrible issues. Um, those are multicultural teams, so there are Russians and Americans. All Russians knew English, none of the Americans knew Russian. Sure, Russians knew English. But they were pissed that Americans didn't make an effort to learn Russian. Right. So they were getting angry about it. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's a very cramped environment. Um, so window time. Okay, yeah. when you're at the window and look outside, that's the only time you can have privacy. You can just kind of block everything else out. So window time, why do Russians get more time than us? Treadmill time was another killer. <laughs> um, everybody wanted more treadmill time. And they, were, they really were almost ready to strangle each other. There's also the instance of um, Biosphere 2. Are you familiar yeah, with yes. that? Yeah, yeah exactly. and so that was where um, you know eight people entered a sealed environment in <clears throat> in um, in New Mexico in and Arizona. Arizona? Yeah, Arizona. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and and they down. yeah, and they actually split into factions of two yeah. of two groups basically that weren't speaking <laughs> to each other. So they would only you know they they really weren't speaking to each other. How long were they there? Uh, two years. <laughs> and I think that I forget. When the breakdown. One or two demanded egress. They didn't want to stay, so they. I think at least one had to be gotten out because it was just disintegrating. Yeah, but they found so so eight somehow, and there was some study afterward that somehow eight is too big. Somehow it splits these split into smaller groups. I don't know. What, was there any work done on the dynamics before they went in there, or was it just whoever showed up got in? No, they matched them. There was they very did. big so-called insight, but again, in those extreme environments, the predictable things don't work anymore. It just breaks down. And I know that there is a new interest in it, in, in that among, for example, group therapy social workers who want to use the findings from the space research into building those group dynamics into the group therapy work with, for example, our vulnerable populations, you know, teenagers at risk or something like that. Um, NASA's number and the international space flight community number was seven, both well, seven to eight. And so the international space station was designed for seven astronaut occupancy, um, which hasn't happened because at some point Americans stopped uh, supporting it in terms of the uh, second Bush first administration of the second Bush president when he decided that we don't have the money for that. So the international community said, but it's international, don't you have obligations? So they, it's been three to four people occupancy since that time on, which really is a kiss of death because that's barely enough to do the maintenance so that it doesn't get contaminated and fall apart. It's not enough. It's not enough to do research and to really continue creative exploration. So not much has been done on the space station since then, other than keeping it operational. We kind of have this fallout with Russia recently. Well, we still have an obligation since NASA decommissioned the shuttle. NASA doesn't have anything that flies now, but they do still have the international obligation towards the International Space Station. So they pay the Russians $70 million per astronaut per launch to fulfill those obligations um, until we United can't make boosters, right? They have the only rocket engines, I think. They have the only rocket that can bring astronauts from here to the space station. Elon Musk has an engine that can take cargo, but no one is as yet 
advanced enough to take people. And in space flight, they don't want a fatality. That will be very bad. PR and will take it back a couple of years. So, but the questions about psychological environment is, first of all, it's, it's very tightly connected with food. Second of all, it's one of the most difficult ones. One where NASA isn't as omnipotent as they are with technology and with funding. We just don't know. I mean, you know, the movie is about survival in some sort of wilderness, and not, and the books written about it, and supposedly based on real experience, they're not applicable because it's just one person or two people. It's not the people who are deliberately put there for a certain number of months or years, who are not just there for a ride, but they have to do tasks. So what about submarines? Who? Submarines. submarines. Yeah. Problems up to here. But it's something. similar in some Yes, ways. but it's a military discipline environment. There's a chain of command and and there is hierarchy that is in your bones. Every astronaut is a prima donna in his or her own There is no such military discipline and cannot be in a creative environment. I think that's why. And I'm glad you asked that question. I think that's why this cooperative work of space scientists with artists and with writers, with people who explore the other dimension of human psyche, who really understand that much better than scientists do. That's where the value is, to bring this kind of art to start these kind of conversations, to illuminate something that, you know, NASA scientists are not thinking about. They just, it just doesn't occur to them. It didn't occur to them during the near times that it would be a nice gesture for Americans to know 20 Russian words. It's just, it just <laughs> expresses a good feeling. Of course Russians know English. That's not the point. Yeah. Well, but now it's an ISS. I mean, it's not, that was mere when they didn't know the English. Now language. it's a requirement. Yeah, they have to know Russian and another language. Mm -hmm. Do we have time for one more question? Any questions? No. You didn't bring any food with you, did you? <laughs> Tonight? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you had enough. I have a question. Did you collect from people who tried your foods? during the actual eating events. Did you collect any feedback, like let's say later on, how did it feel consuming that food? Did they feel comfortable inside? How did it feel? Did they feel like, you know, like I, if I eat a good Russian borscht, I just, I just feel ecstatically happy. That taste lingers. Do, do the, do, did you debrief them like the next day? No, but um, I think we should have a follow-up, like some kind of follow-up survey. Yeah. That would be really fun, I actually. I think that yeah, would yeah, yeah. have some interesting stuff. How it felt, yeah, remembering after. that, thinking <laughs> about that yeah. food.